Hello everyone, welcome, welcome one more time to this course ASET 104. A lot of people is joining. Thank you so much for coming in. This is the fourth day. I'm so happy for you. You have reached the fourth day. Yesterday we got we got an amazing day, and, and there's something I want to tell you about the topics we reviewed yesterday because there were like a lot of questions, but I will just tell you in a minute. In the meantime, well, just welcome. You know me. I'm your instructor. So welcome to the fourth day, the AZ-104, so you can become a Microsoft Azure administrator. And this is what I want to tell you today. It's about... Oh, it's in the other one. It's about you becoming administrators, right? I'm not saying that you have to become experts right now. The certification, it's not about you being uh, um, like high level of expertise in each of the resources and knowing at perfection everything, okay? This is administrator certification. So what it means is that you need to have the enough knowledge about the resources and tools to know what are um, how much you can do on the platform, how much you can do on Azure to develop that that solution. For saying uh, just an example, if you are an administrator of any company and that X company has several departments and several workers, the administrator itself he knows uh, the different the different uh, um, jobs and, and tasks that there should be around the organization, but that does not mean the administrator administrator has to know exactly uh, how to operate, for example, a machinery. That's why they got a person working operating that that machine or operating that vehicle. Why I'm saying this because uh, yesterday there were a lot of a, a lot of questions um, we got on on some topics that we were seeing and I was trying to go as fast as I can because uh, we just scratch over the surface uh, some some of the topics I don't go that deep because it's uh, I mean of course it's necess necessary but once again we are not becoming experts right. So that's why for me it's more important that you know all the resources that there is for you to help you during your the development of your solution and what you can do um, with all of the, the resources. Because uh, yesterday we, we, we get some topics, um, for example, talking about the VPNs and the P rings and talking about the, the DNS and the gateways. And there's a lot of people starting to make questions, right? It's like when we get to scratch a virtual machines, uh, there's going to be a lot of people asking me questions. Of course, there's going to be questions, right? Um, also, there were some some people pretty much uh, asking me for or presenting me like the whole scenario in their company. Uh, like, hey, listen, I have uh, this in my company. If it's possible to do, uh, you're going to get there, you know, in time. You are in, in, in a good uh, path. So you're gonna get there in time. Don't don't rush your, yourself. Um, it's important to know, of course, the information is very important. But don't rush your, yourself. Don't um, overload uh, yourself with too much information. You know? So we, we can we can have all the knowledge about uh, maybe the storage, right? And maybe we're gonna have just a few questions about storage in 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 the certifications. Uh, that's why we get uh, to see all the topics and to see uh, all the different subjects and explain explaining to you what are they and what they do, right? About the configuration, we just scratch the surface. You know, we have to to write a name for the for the solution for the resource and, and then select a group for it or a resource group and select region. You know about the configurations, right? And as m more you advance into the certification path in Azure, more you will be knowing in deep for each one of those. So don't rush yourself. That's what I'm trying. That's what actually I'm trying to, to say. Uh, because uh, yesterday I saw just like a bump of questions just, just coming, right? And well, you know me, 
I'm your instructor, Rodolfo Moreno, also known as Fofo404, and I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer, and I'm here to guiding and lead you through um, the learning path, okay? So remember, this is elite, trying to make you know which one it's, it's going to be the way why, uh, where you should be learning. Of course, there is a, a learning path in, in, in Microsoft that you can follow as well. And there's a lot of information all around. Remember the rules of the class, keep attention, have a lot of fun what you what you learn. In the case of a disconnection, just stay tuned and wait for following instructions, it happens. Right now it's uh, nine o'clock in the morning, universal time, and it's actually raining in, the, in my end right here. So in case of disconnection, just please stay stay tuned. Don't be shy, please feel free to interact and participate on the chat like yesterday. Yes, I was just loving all the questions. Just uh, keep it doing like that. That is just awesome. And before we begin, I have a little activity for you. And let's have, a, uh, let's have some fun. And this activity, uh, you can bring out your cell phone and scan it. And this activity, it's about knowing, like I know that each one of you have different uh, backgrounds in technology. Each one of you uh, work in different areas in your own organizations and your own companies. And and I <clears throat> sorry. And I would like to know in Azure which resource it's the one that you want to learn more. Um, you know, like from all the resources that you have reviewed, reviewed so far, which one is the resource that you do you feel or, or you are interested into into knowing into knowing more? Let me just put this one in the other screen so I can. it in the other screen there's here people joining okay I will take out the, the QR code from the screen so I can share the screen there's hi Hudson I, I see your name <laughs> on it Okay, there's some people wanted to know about virtual desktops, firewalls. Uh, for virtual desktop, it's, there's actually a certification that get, guides you through that stuff. That, that's what I, what I meant, you know, like, I know that there's a, a lot of people asking questions about things they want to know, but that path, it's it's not uh, it's not here yet, you know, it's like, there's like two step ahead of you. You don't have to worry about it. And for the virtual desktop, I recommend you the ASET 140. That that will be for the virtual desktop. Uh, Hussein, hello, Hussein. Logic apps. Uh, okay, we're gonna scratch a little bit about today about the logic apps. All of the above. Azure virtual desktop, the ARM templates, the ARM virtual machines will be the the templates, I guess. Kubernetes, uh, we're going to be talking about Kubernetes today, the gateway. Um, if you want to know more about networking, there is a certification for networking, which is the AZ700. That's what I, what I was, uh, what I meant, you know. This is about administ administering or, or administrating um, Azure. And to order to you have that certification, you need to know what are, are the resources that you can count count on to develop the solution. That does not mean, of course, it's very important that you know it on perfection, but you don't have to become expertise right now in each one of the resources, right? So imagine if I have to go deep, deep, and deeply on each resource and explain you what we can do with one of those and how we can configure it in different ways, we will not be finished this course in only one week, right? So. That is why um, some people want to know about the the load balancers, uh, disaster recovery. We're going to be talking today about that. Azure security as well today. 
prepare to the exam. Uh, that's going to be tomorrow. Load balancers, uh, resources, the network, the bastions. The bastion, it, it's another way to connect. Um, imagine that you want to connect to, to one computer and we actually uh, do it via RDP, remote desktop. But imagine that you want like many people connecting to that computer. So we can create bastions for it. So a lot of people can connect. Um, it, it's quite expensive because uh, you need to, you know, like uh, I create a connectivity for different users. I did it once um, and I'm not going to do it again. I, I, I mean, uh, for me, there's no need for doing bastions for, by the way, uh, for the way I work. But when I, when I did it, um, I just bulk like this list of users. And the next day I was just spending all of my credit uh, because that, that means that that the connectivity for the, for the bastion for X number of users and the virtual machine should be active the whole time. So for that, because it's a pay-as-you-go service, you're going to be uh, you're going to be charged. Virtual machines, networking, storage, uh, managed identity, the firewalls, the network, the vnets. Okay, that is nice because. I can see that you got uh, a lot of idea of the resources, which is which is really good. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for for sharing Azure Security Databases. Is that's in the storage? Thank you so much for all your comments. That is nice. And well, yesterday we were talking about the. Oh, we, we see this yesterday. Sorry, this is just for the presentation. This is not the presentation. So let me just go really quick to see what's going on with this. Just give me one second. How do I jump to that one? Just one second. Oh. Oh, we talked about the blob storage, right? What happened here? I'm supposed to be getting all these ready to this one, but not really. Awesome. So today I want to talk to you about the virtual machine. Virtual machines that you have been worked on a couple days since the first lap uh, number one, and you already know what you can do with the virtual machine. You already know why do we need to deploy the virtual machines. So, what happens when you configure the virtual machine? When you deploy it, what are the, the first thing that you've been asked? You need to determine what is going to be the size of that uh, virtual machine. Of course, according to the type, Okay, that's going to come with the cost, right? We got general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized, story optimized, GPU optimized as well, and the high performance um, compute. So you have to understand that each one of those types is going to have, of course, different configurations on your virtual machine. Could be um, high memory, uh, high CPU to memory radio or specialized virtual machines that you need to renderizing a, a video or like I did it in, in the past, I just get a GPU virtual machine to play video games because my <laughs> my computer wasn't that good uh, uh, at graphics and I love to play uh, a, a flight simulator game. And, and well, I had to do that, right? So just to compare if the graphics were working. And according to the, the, the size and to the machine that you need, it's going to be the way of, uh, it's gonna be charged. Once that you know about the virtual machine and you determine what which size or which one uh, you need, you need to also determine the storage of that machine. Okay, you have to know and I'm sure that you already know because yesterday we were working on the F drive in some labs. We had to download some files, put it in the F drive. 
It's like the same thing if you have a physical machine. You can mount mount a different drive on the machine, and you can um, as well configure each drive for uh, different uh, um, storage. You know, temporary uh, storage. Maybe your disk for your operating system. Maybe your disk for the data. Maybe you want to have a, another disk uh, for the um, another disk for the blobs or for your files. You can create uh, the storage as you as you want. Also, you know that you can create managed and unmanaged disk. All right. So all these you have seen already into the labs. That's why I get you going to the labs. So you know what I was talking about exactly. Oh, I remember that when you create a temporary disk, what happened with the content can be lost because we set up a time for that content content uh, to be to be on the on the disk, right? Just for me. As well, we get to see different ways to connect with the virtual machine, right? We use the RDP, which is the remote desktop. We can use also the secure socket host, or we can use the secure socket layer. That's the three ways that we use to connect to our uh, remote. As well, we can connect through the bastion, like I was saying. And we need to have the port 443 open. You have that uh, that connectivity. And you have to know that the Secure Shell protocol for Linux is based on virtual machine. Uh, we work a lot with uh, Linux. We work a lot with uh, Windows as well. There's uh, the, the chance to, to mount a uh, Mac OS operating system if, if you need or any operating system which it, it's of your like. So we can do that. And to connect with the virtual machines, of course, as you know, that you need to create and open those protocols to have them connected via RDP, via SSH, or depending the via that you want. So this example, you actually, more than an example, you have been doing this step a couple of times. You entered your virtual machine, you entered the overview, you entered your resource, you hit connect, and you've been deployed with these three options, RDP, socket, uh, secure socket host, or the bastion, and you choose which one, uh, which way you want to connect to that virtual machine, right? As well, remember that we were talking some of the benefits about the cloud, which is the high availability. We can configure the virtual machines who also have high availability. How we do that? Because we can set up availability sets. So what it means that in my availability set, of course, I need to give it a name. And it has to be a unique name. We have to select uh, uh, a region, and we can choose how many full domains we want to have and how many update domains we want to use. So two or more instances on availability set, that will give, give us a 99.95% .95 of service legal agreement. So that means our um, solution is going to be all the time there, ready, and available for us. We can configure multiple machines in virtual sets. So you can configure as many as you, you, you need. You can configure each application tire into separate availability sets. So I can have uh, the application tire uh, with another availability set. Jacqueline Higgins, um, the availability sets, and this is a qu uh, something we were talking actually yesterday, does it need to be in the same region? Mm, I will say yes about the availability set, but remember that you can connect to different availability zones. 
And the availability zones, like we were uh, talking yesterday, we have a zone redundant, we have a local redundant, we have a region redundant, and globally uh, uh, re uh, region redundant. So we can also specify that, you know, we can have that connectivity between all of the regions and, and choose where do we have an, uh, where do we want to have those virtual virtual machines. So when we create availability zone, in this case, it needs to be in a unique physical location in a region. So that means this is going to be my availability zone, okay? Because I'm making available maybe in the same data center, okay, inside the same data center or between the others data centers in my region. You ask, is it possible to be pairing with another region? Well, if I have another region subscription where I create my uh, my virtual machine, my storage account, yes, I can make a tie with that. But uh, in order to understand it better, it's just how many uh, copies, if you want to see it that way, how many copies we want to to create, how many instances we want to create to be available in the different places. So that includes the, uh, the data centers with independent power cooling and networking. So each in data center is going to be independent. So if you choose the whole region, that will give you 99.99% of service le legal agreement. So it's not the same thing that I choose to have my three sets here because I have full domain. So I want to ask about the full domain. And in case this one falls here, the other ones can access the other two, but I have them in the same data center. So that means they have the same electricity and power cooling and, and networking, etc. Or I can choose to have them in maybe one because this is uh, red, so I can change the color. I can choose to have an, one here, maybe because I choose to have uh, three availabil availability sets, and I can choose to have the other two here. Or maybe one here, one here, and the other one in here. Okay, so it's up to me how do I select to have that availability. Of course, if I select one, one, and one, that makes me provide with the 99% of service legal agreement of compliant that all the services are going to be there as well. I have my, my availability set. What else I can do with my virtual machines? I can make them grow either vertical or horizontal. So what it means, vertical means that my same server, that my same virtual machine, I can just upgrade it like um, adding maybe more, more disk, adding more RAM, making better uh, the processor or so, so on. And horizontal scaling, it means that I have the same type of solution, maybe my same, same server, my same virtual machine, and I am scaling in number. So I am creating the same one more, more time. And also the thing that we can do on Azure is that we can create this uh, uh, scaling, we can create a scale set and we can make them uh, automatically. If you are in your on premises and then you need to scale, what you need to do, you need to buy more, more, more equipment, right? And maybe you don't need it anymore and you still have the equipment there. So that's a capital expenditure, right? So in the case of the cloud, if you need to scale, scale up, no problem, you just scale up and when you decide, you can automa automat uh, automate uh, your threshold. And when it hits, hits that threshold, you can just reduce uh, that scaling, okay? So you are going to be charged only for the time that the, the scale set was working and then you come back to the 
to the old one. Uh, you're welcome, Jacqueline. I, I, I hope I can answer, I answer your question. I'm trying to see all the questions um, at the same time during the, the lecture. That's why I, I was telling you, like, keep attention to all times because sometimes it's really easy to, to lose me, you know, and just keep it in attention. Oh, this is what I was saying. You can create the scale sets and you can choose uh, how many scales, where is my, how many scale sets you can start with zero up to 1000. Okay. Also the instance size, you can choose the size of the scale set that it's going to be. And well, the spot instance, I will, I will tell you about a spot when uh, on use capacity, uh, capacity at discount rate. And use, of course, manage disk, and you are enabled to scaling up to 100 instances. Okay, so you can create a count for how many you are going to beginning with, and then how many uh, you're, you do want to to scale up. And also, you will de decide the, the threshold. You will decide in which moment uh, you will make that happen and how do you do that because you have your minimum vms which is one your maximum vms that you already customize it because you want it like that okay and you said every time my machine okay gets to 75 percent of threshold of walking for at least 10 minutes please increase one virtual machine, okay? And then it says, if my virtual machine is working on 25% of workload, just reduce one virtual machine, okay? And we can do that scale set from one up to 1,000, right? And how many instances we can create? 100. So we can do that instead of buying computers when we need it. And then if we don't need it anymore, how do we uh, uh, recover that money that we already spent? Right? So all those stuff, it's what we can do on Azure. And that those are the stuff that I, I need you to know. Okay? Those are the stuff that are important you as an administrator to no one understand, right? We're not going exactly uh, to configure a virtual machine, to deploy an app and to create something inside and create an instance. And because I, I know that you want to know that, okay? But right now it's administrative certification, which takes your time to know all the resources, to know what is everything there. It's like when you go into the school, right? The first day of school, maybe the second day, maybe the first week, uh, you get to know the name, the names of your of your uh, classmates, right? And with time, you get to know each of your class classmates better. So it's the same thing. We don't. We are not here to know everybody on deep. We get to here to know who's the classmates, all right? Wh whom we are going to be working. So that's what we do here. Thank you, thank you, all you're welcome. Now we have in, in the virtual machines, we have something called extensions. And I'm sure extensions, it's not something new for you. I'm sure the extension, sorry for it. Uh, it's something that you already know. Um, I'm sure that you have download extensions on your browser, you know, maybe for blocking some ads or some extensions for accessing better some resources or tools, you know? So the same thing, we can create extension on our virtual machines. And not, not only that, that those extensions, we can make them automatic. We can make automation tasks. So imagine that I am deploying a virtual machine. So instead of I connect to the virtual machine via RDP and then install a server or install an IIS, I can create an automation task that it's going to set when you deploy the virtual machine and the virtual machine is ready, automatically 
create the instance for the server and you can install or you can um, use as many extensions as uh, as you need maybe i can uh, go to the portal uh, if i can find my, my portal where should be my portal somewhere the portal it's here and i go to the marketplace extensions maybe i have here in the marketplace some extensions for developers Oops. I go to the marketplace. So pretty much it's knowing that there is extensions available and that we can create those extensions for our our resources got it okay you can create well this is templates and stuff you already being here and you can download as many as you need okay, we just need an extension for GB ups So you can choose, uh, there are like, like like too many. So pretty much the, the, the most important thing about extensions, it's like you can provide post deployment. Okay, so when the virtual machine is deployed, it will automate task on it. And you can manage that with your CLI, with the PowerShell, with the ARM templates as well, and into the Azure portal you can create um those extensions are similar to cloth in it um it will it will be like um you know uh, when you start your computer just you have some applications that are running at the same time that you start the computer and sometimes are all of the applications because we do not unselect that part, right? So it's pretty much the same. Uh, if you are working, uh, for example, with Microsoft Teams and you install Microsoft Teams in your computer, and then when you open in your bar, you will see that the Microsoft Team is working. It's there, right? Um, it used to happen with Skype and with some apps that we install in our computer, they just run at startup. That's an extension right um we created to uh, have an automation task when the virtual machine is deployed but i'm not saying only for teams or or, or webex or, or, or um, skype but also for different um tasks that's that, that you need okay And uh, something about the, the instance else against uh, the extensions. I think that's it. That's uh, pretty much what I, I I I need you to to understand. Of course, you can configure the extensions via the script. Okay, it can be simple or complex. Have ninety minutes to run. So that means, like, for the first ninety minutes of uh, of your deployment those extensions will be um, trying to run or doing the, the executable um, process also the scripts can be protected by encryption sometimes we have some sensitive information that we need to automate automate so we can encrypt it so we can select the file where we're going to do uh, run that script of the automation we're going to do on the deployment and voila that will be it when we implement a desired state of configuration what we are saying here it's how we want to start that that virtual machine 
So what is the first state of configuration? Instead of deploying the virtual machine and from the virtual machine installing the IIS, I can create a configuration to direct install the IIS as the first task on it. So when I access, I will not be accessing a virtual machine itself. I will be accessing the IIS portal, okay? Because I create that uh, um, automate task to create that web server in the first instance, all right? So we can have a lot of built-in uh, resources. We can uh, configure a lot of them. And of course, we can do block or blocks of, of resources, right? All those stuff, we can do it in our virtual machines. Now, I don't have to explain too much because you already been working on, right? You already understand how to deal with the virtual, with the virtual machine. So that is just wonderful, all right? And now, and changing the topic, the virtual machine was something that we already know what they are there, and that's a nice resource. We have something called the compute options as, as PaaS, as the platform as a service. So we have these compute options, and there was someone uh, asking about the the web app services right there into the, into the first slide when we do the activity. And in some cases, we do not need so much of compute uh, power, you know, because maybe what we need to deploy is just a small application, it's just a small uh, solution. And for those kind of things, we have the platform as a service where I'm not requiring requiring all the, all uh, only the infrastructure to Azure, but I'm also asking, hey, Azure, um, I know that you are going to give me the infrastructure, but you please be in charge of the virtual machines and stuff so I can only focus on develop my application? For sure, that's what we call a platform as a service. And they will give you that platform as a service so you can have different um, service service plans to develop your um, your solution, right? So when you are going to implement that solution, you need to first of all define a set of compute resources for a web app to run. You need to define which one is going to be the resources that I'm going to be needing, from storage, networking. You know, you have to define all the resources that you need. You need to define what kind of performance uh, you, you're going to need. Uh, let's say that you are um, looking for the size of your VM, for the size mm, that you need to deploy that that uh, that uh, web app. Okay. Also, more than one app can be configured to run in the same service plan. So you can have many different app running in the same service plan. And talking about the plans, remember yesterday we were talking about the web service and this is the app service, okay? We have different SKUs and, and sorry, different SKUs and different features. So according to the to this queue, we have the free one, we have the shared one, um, maybe dedicated and development and test, production and workloads, and so on. You can choose which one do you want. So I can have three, ten different apps in the in the free SKU, one hundred apps or unlimited on the next one. How much this space is going to be available for me? One gigabyte, ten gigabyte, fifty gigabytes, a terabyte. Auto it's auto scale available. Auto scale is going to be supported only from standard to premium and isolated. What are the maximum number of instances I can create? Well, in the free you cannot create instances. In the shared you cannot, but in basic you can create up to three instances, and so on. All right. So as well, according to what you want to, de 
to deploy and how many apps you need to deploy it's the service plan that you are going to get okay so maybe you are going to be asked hey, I need to deploy one app so what is the service plan that you recommend and you will start to see okay I got the basic I got the standard I got the premium so it's only one app right and they don't asking maybe in the requirements that it need to be out of scalable and they don't asking that you need uh, some instances for full domain so if not then you recommend the solution like the cheapest one that will be free the free one but you can also be recommending uh, recommending the other ones once again knowing uh, that we have different service plans and 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 they work different according to the future is what I uh, I'd like you to understand okay you can ask the same you can scale up and scale out the service plan so what that means is like growing scale the same thing that we did with the virtual machines we can do it with our uh, app service because uh, let's visualize the apps as really really small um, uh, computers I don't know if you're aware about the raspberries uh, the Arduino the Raspberry Pi um, and, and this kind of uh, of boards that we can actually mount a, a small computer on it so how many of them you want to have them in your in, in your virtual machine that is being provided by the platform okay and we can do that scale up maybe i can set up uh five apps uh, up uh, instances and then just keep scaling until the 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 demand redu is reduced and then I can down downscale it again and I can create that scale up or scale out in the service plan okay so it's also possible to do it how did you configure this the service plan pretty much as we were configuring the availability sets you know like like scale set sorry you will choose in which the minimum instance limit which is your maximum instance limit you will adjust the, the available resources that it's going to be based in the demand that you having for your app so you can as well improve your availability and fault tolerance and scale based on the metric that it means on the capacity of your cpu your memory and the http request so according to the machine or to the CPU that you have select that service plan, okay, you're going to have this, a percentage of threshold of, uh, of a workload and you can select from which percentage you are going to deploy the scaling, like the scale, the scale up or scaling, scale out, okay. Also, it's important, uh, don't forget to scale in. I mean, you have to monitor all the time your resources, uh, maybe the threshold, it hasn't been reached and the machines are working the apps are working but you find out that there is no necessary right now so scale in so right or downgrade your your uh, your scale set in, in virtual machines otherwise the machines are going to be there and and, and charging you for for some money okay How do you configure the app services? For the people that it's been uh, working yesterday on the lab, you will see that we have the app service where we can be just working with a lot of programming languages from your uh, like, according to each one that you that you uh, that you want. You got the fully managed environment. So all that you have to do is just work on your code. That's the, the good thing of the pass as a platform as a service. It will provide you with all the tools necessary for you just being focused and concentrating in your app. So you don't have to deploy the virtual machine, configure the virtual machine, create the virtual environment, create the, the engines for the databases and stuff. No, 
because you are getting the service as a platform. And all that you have to do is just working on your and your app. You create that instance and well, this is something that you already been working on. When you create the app service and pretty much when you create any resource in Azure, you have to give some parameters, right? So we have to fill up the parameters and of course we need to give them a name, what kind of access, the resource group, the runs time, the time stack that we want to be running, maybe .NET, maybe Java, um, it's up to you. The operating system we're going to be working on, if it's going to be published as a Docker container or, or, or what kind of um, Doc, it's, uh, Docker is going to have, and choosing the region close to your users and what is the service plan, you know, like what is going to be the queue. It's going to be the free one. It's going to be, um, it's going to be the free one. It's going to be the standard, it's going to be the premium, and so on. You will select in which going to be, uh, it's going to be the, the SKU, right? Or am I here? SKUs inside. This one is, for example, is going to be a standard, which is going to give me 100 apps available and 1.5 gigabyte memory. And I can change the size. I can change the size if I, if I want. So um, if you have been working before with apps, if you have been working before with some uh, development, uh, I'm pretty sure that you have uh, worked with uh, control versions uh, like GitHub, right? And in GitHub, when we are working uh, developers, testers, and, 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 and production, we get the opportunity to generate different versions of, of the deployment of the app. And we can create different um, versions of it. Like for example, a version for staging, we can create a version for production. Okay. And you will be choosing from which version you want to do the deployment. So we are creating uh, slots. Those slots are going to be there so we can be working on the different versions of the app. So I can create many slots as, as I need. Maybe I need uh, one slot for development that is going to be working on staging for the developers. Then I create another slot for uh, the testers, you know, and if everything is approved, then I create another slot for production that it's going to be all the users are going to uh, use the the app from the production, the production uh, instance from from that slot. So when we are going to are, are going that, we have to be careful uh, of working as developers as well. From which um, slot, from uh, from which one, we are getting the the information. Okay, um, it's like like doing the fork on on GitHub. Okay, so developer one. And developer two is working on the same app. Both of them make a commit into the GitHub, okay? And that commit, both of them came into the staging where it's going to be compared, the work that one is done and the other one, and then we can do the swap to production to deploy that, that application. It's something that we don't have if we are developing in our own computer and with our own team. And then we we don't have this uh, version control. And, and if we are creating this version control, well, sometimes we get to have some problems. So working with GitHub as version control may be cracking and there's so many options there, you can do it, okay? You can add the deployment slots as many as as you as you need. I uh, will just name production, 
okay and it says if i want to add any clone settings to it okay so the clone set settings it's like i can choose to clone from a special uh, from a special slot even when i download the repository okay so pay attention to the settings you can slot specific app settings and connection string continuous deployment settings or app app service authentication setting review and edit your settings before swapping how many times i've been telling you during these uh, three four days that it's important to read don't give for settle that uh i just create a resource and oh it's already filled so it's automatic no you have to read over and over again if it's the correct parameters that are sure it's it's giving you if not make the correct ones the app service can be secure yes of course it can be secure did you know you know that in azure we have um a lot of good security and to enter the app uh, service what you will be needing you need to be authenticated yourself to uh, do the authentication or you can also use the default anonymous you can log in with a third party identity provider with no problem the security that it offers is uh, troubleshoot with diagnostic logs you can have app logins you can add uh, a, so a secure socket layer to, to your certificate of the HTTPS, or you can also define priority in order to allow or deny a list to control network access to your app, like creating a policy. And you can as well store the secrets in the Azure Key Vault, where you can have all of those. One more thing, uh, two days ago, we were talking about the DNS and, and, and the DNS domains, I'm sorry. And we can create um, the same thing. We can create a custom domain name for our, our solution. And that will be redirect default to that web app URL. So instead of using uh, maybe an IP number or a really long long string for your URL, you can create that custom domain. And uh, DNS is registered for your demand pro uh, provider. And it will be create either a C name or our A record with the mapping. Okay, you have to make sure that your service plan includes the custom domain. Okay. Of course, if you select the free, the free one, let me just go back to, if you choose the free one, where is it? Was that how? Okay. Uh, you should at least select the basic one if you want you to create that DNS at least. And you back up the service? Yes, you can back up. Uh, there is two ways to do. Well, I don't know if I if I have to call it two ways, but you can create a, a backup, not only for the app service. You know, like you can create uh, a lot of uh, backups in each of your resources. You can do logs. You can do backups. You can download the templates. So there is a lot of way to create that um, security for you as well um, in the in the in the vault you can create some some snapshots and and and, and some images but not all of them uh, can be back up i mean to be back up there's only certain um how can i say it like like you cannot back up um, for example, I'll just go back to the other one. You can vault everything, okay? But the backups, it's only for databases or it's only for configurations. You cannot actually do a whole 
a whole backup. For that, you get the vault. In the vault, you can save pretty much everything. So that that that's uh, kind of the, the difference, you know. Um, but yes, in the case of the app services, you can do backups, and you can have them like manually or or in schedule. You can program those those uh, those backups, and it, it requires you to have uh, a standard um, and premium plan. That's what I'm saying. Like you cannot back up everything. So if you have a standard premium, it's okay. But maybe you deploy a couple of apps in in the free or in the basic, and it cannot be backed up that way. But let me give you a, a tip. If you have those versions uh, of, of plans, you can create a vault. And in that vault, well, you will not have like everything updated, but at least you will have something to start on in case of something happen and you couldn't uh, recover from, from, from that. Um, the, the backups can be up to 10 gigabytes per app and database content. So you can have a lot. And you can configure partial. You can configure a part of the backup and exclude items of the backup. You will choose uh, what part of, uh, of the backup of the service you want to back it up. Maybe I just want to back up the parameters or I want to back up some templates. I don't want to back up like the whole front end uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the app, right? I just only need the back end of the app. So you can restore your app on demand to a previous state or create a new app, right? And now, ladies and gentlemen, something that is really interesting that uh, me in the beginning, it makes me confused a little bit. Uh, but once I get to see the slides or the way that I'm showing you the slides, you will understand that it's not that, that bad. We have the virtual machines, okay? We understood the virtual machines as a big thing. And then we talked about app servicing plans. So it's where I don't need like the whole machine because I'm getting the service as a platform. So what is the container instances? What are the Kubernetes? So it's a small instances of machines, okay? That it's going to be there for running the services that I need without getting all the regular process that we use in a virtual machine. Clear as water in this example. For example, where is my, my, here is my marker. I got my virtual machine, one, my virtual machine, two. So what do I need to deploy that virtual machine? Okay, I need to, have a server, I need to have a host, I need to create an hypervisor, then create a guest operating system, add some bins and libraries, and then create my app, okay, just to be deploying that virtual machine. So this isn't the case that I have it in uh, the infrastructure as a service, right, where I, I need to be in charge of configuring everything. But maybe my solution does not require to have all that to be configured. I need to be just focused more into developing my app. It's my app is just ready. I just need a place to, to make it work, right? So what Azure and Microsoft thought is like, okay, so if you're gonna get it as a platform, as a service, I will provide you with a server. I will provide you with a host operating system according to your need, of course, all right? You're gonna be sharing a space with someone else's, maybe, and there you're gonna have some beans and libraries where you can deploy your apps without you to, uh, without you to need to have the whole virtual machine. So you can create the app containers instead of that, right? That will give you isolation. It's gonna be easy for the deployment. It's gonna be persistent in its storage and as well as all the services, it's gonna have full tolerance. What are the benefits if you are deploying the container? First of all, 
understand that it's a platform as a service. So that's the biggest benefit. You don't need to configure everything that is behind you. Everything that is like in the infrastructure, that's going to be uh, that's going to be not for you to worry. Steam says that uh, 10 gigabytes doesn't seem like a lot of space in the absolute limit. Of course, 10 gigabytes, it's, it's nothing. And when I was uh, younger, I was amused by the diskettes and the floppy and how much we can save there, you know, like a picture or a couple of seconds of sound. Another benefit of using the container, and for me, like kind of the best benefit is the time. It's not, it's not going to have the same resolution time that me deploying a virtual machine, waiting for everything to configure. Maybe I have some extensions to be deployed in, in, in automatic, and then I deployed the, the app. So because I'm not doing all that process, my deployment, my app deployment is going to be fast, like really, really fast, you know? So we get the fast startup times. It will help us to provide connectivity and DNS name. Of course, I can create a DNS resolution for my app. The features are going to be isolated. So that means I don't have everything into the same, into the same uh, machine. So each one is working with its own, uh, with own uh, resources. The size can, to be, can be customizable. The storage, as I said, is, is persistence. I can create groups and, of course, create a virtual network. Uh, deployment. You've, been, you, you've seen that uh, in everything, in, in, in pretty much all of the resources, we create groups, right? So that's a lot of the things they ask you uh, during the test. Um, imagine that I have a couple of apps that I want to deploy in the same instance. So what should I create? Um, well, I create an app group, right? where I create a group of instances or a container group. And then you start, I'm sorry, I'm just reading a question. And then it, you, can, you can start. So it's the fastest way to run a container in Azure without provisioning a virtual machine. That's what I'm saying. Instead of you to run the whole machine, you don't need it. You just need to work for your container, so that's going to be easier. You can implement the container groups as you need it. There is a top level resource in, in, in the container instances, and you can have a collection of containers, okay? When saying this uh, about a collection of containers, what I'm trying to say is, remember like the policies, and we create a, a policy initiative so we can do the same thing, but not with policies. We can do the same thing with containers, all right? And I can create a container group, all right, like an initiative. And each one in that container could be different apps, all right? All of them could be different apps or could be the same apps. Or could, it could be like that initiative uh, that I wanted uh, to work. And the containers in the groups share a life cycle, like the resources, the local network, and the storage volume. So they're going to be into the same life cycle. So that we, we're going to have uh, that initiative, like the Avengers initiative, remember? So all of the apps is like the superheroes. All of them is like, uh, what was the names? So Iron Man, Hulk, uh, Ant-Man, uh, and all of those. And they are going to share the same life cycle. Why is the life cycle that they uh, belong to the Avenger initiative? So they have to use the same, the same plane. They have to live in the same place. Um, they have the same fights, things like that. So we create that, uh, that, that group, okay? And talking about the instances of the containers, we have the Kubernetes services. And what is the Kubernetes service? Well, we have few containers, a group of containers here and here, you see, and here. So this one, it's a whole machine that it's working, right? And this machine is provided by Azure. 
So when I get a container, Azure is giving me just a little piece of that virtual machine where I can do the deployment of my app. But maybe I have so many apps and I can have my own, my own, uh, I'm sorry, my on Kubernetes service. So first let's understand, oh, it's a wrong one. First let's understand what is the AKS. What is the Azure Kubernetes service terminology? We got pools, that is a group of nodes with the same configurations. We got nodes that are individual virtual machines running containerized applications. We got as well the pods. Oh, what is not, uh, it's not marking, that is marking here, sorry. We got the pools, we got the nodes, and we got the pods, which is a single instance of an application. A pod can contain many containers. Okay, for example, here in the image, you can see a pod here, and we can have one, two, three containers, or even even more, right? And deployment is something that we have been talking a lot, that it's one or more identical pods managed by Kubernetes. So this is going to be a deployment. If I have many of them, this is my deployment here, which is the second one. And in deployment, I have two different pods. And each pod can have multiple containers. Okay. And all the deployment could be inside of a knot, which means it's working in a single instance. And that knot in that single instance could belong to a pool. Well, not could. It's going to belong to a pool. Right? And we can have different nodes. Imagine that this knot as well has a deployment, and inside that deployment, I have different pods. Another pod here, another uh, pod here, pod here, pod here. So we can do that. And all of this is working in just one single Kubernetes instance. So that's the beauty of it. Oh. Clusters and knots, and we've been talked in the last one. How to explain the clusters? Um, we understand the knots. The knot is going to be the, the, the single computer that is going to be there. Inside that knot, we can have pods living. But what is a cluster? It's going to be um, when you have connected in, oh, let me show you like this, this way. Let me go to the next to show you the networking. Okay, so you got four pods and in the cluster, okay, it's gonna be working for the internal traffic and you can choose what you do with that traffic. So you can have them clusterized according to what you want. Of course, all of them are gonna get to the, to the pod, but you can have them divide in clusters. So you don't have um, overload of, of, of work, okay? So you can have cluster IP provided by internal, the not port that is provide the, marking, the, the mapping for, for the incoming traffic and the load balancer as well. It's going to be external IP for incoming and non-direct uh, uh, traffic. Yes, of course, I'm planning uh, a break. I just wanted to make you understand about the cluster. So the cluster, I have this one here. I can make them divide by, by cluster so I could decide how the traffic is going to be uh, redirected. I like have it like in different boxes. That's what I'm what I was saying. All right. So let's have uh, let's have a break.
of five minutes. See you back at 10.15 in the morning, universal time. Okay, have a, have a break. I'm going to have a refill of my coffee in the meantime.
and the time is up. So I hope that you have a nice break. You refill your beverage, your drink. So w why I'm saying and, and telling you all this about the, the AKS, and, and I think sometimes I'm just giving you too much information. Um, I don't want to make you confuse people. But um, as an administrator, let's imagine this uh, scenario. Um, you asked your uh, developed the department that deploy an app, okay, or several apps, and they will demand you that you need to spend more money because they need to create virtual machines to deploy the app, and they start to giving you like a whole story about the needs and configuration on the cloud. Maybe you don't have enough uh, knowledge about the deployment and configuration. Maybe you don't have enough knowledge about how to uh, uh, code a whole app. But at least you know that you shouldn't be paying that uh, amount of money because you can create pods, you can create the clusters, and you can be you can have containerized everything uh, in the same virtual machine. So that's why you uh, need to understand the resources, not at the level of expertise, but understand that we have them there and we can do things with them. That's that it's that it's why that is why it's called administrator uh, certification. So you know how to administrate this one. Let me just uh, click to reset here and close it. Because there's a lot of people asking me. They, they were asking me so many things. And well, to go deeper into that, there's uh, just follow the certification paths, and and you will be learning more and more and more. All right. Right now, it's about to know all the tools that we can that we can create. What happened with the scaling with the cluster with the Kubernetes services? Do we can scale in scale it? Yes. It's going to be working the same way. Yes, we're going to create instead of creating a new instance or, or, or scaling a new computer, a virtual machine, we are going to scale a new node. And inside those nodes, we can create pods and we can create more pods as we need them. Okay, so yes, we can scale the Azure CoverNet service, right? It wasn't that hard, right? Now, uh, between comparison, um, between the, the, the containers and the virtual machine, this is something I, 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 I like you to understand. That the containers, uh, we can have isolation, operating system deployment, uh, this, the storage is going to be persistent. We're going to have full tolerance. Okay, we're going to have the same features in the containers in the virtual machines with a slight difference. For example, the container it provides lightweight isolation, while the the machine it provides complete isolation because it's going to be just be uh, to totally a part of the of the whole solution. And the container is going to be lightweight isolation because you are going to have different containers inside or the same Kubernetes. So it's going to be lightweight. In the case of the operating system, you can run the, the, the user portion of the system, of the operating system, and you can tailor it according to your need. But in the case of the virtual machine, when you run the operating system, that's going to be the operating system that you are going to use all the time because that's the operating system that you configure in the kernel. In the case of the container, the deployment that you use is going to be in the independent. It's going to be individual for each container. So that means that each container is going to have its own Docker. Okay, and That Docker is going to be the command line so you can deploy maybe one or multiple containers. But in the case of the virtual machines, when you do a deployment, you have to using use Windows Admin Center on the Hyper-V Manager, and you also can deploy virtual machines using the PowerShell, the system search on virtual machine manager. So yes, there is difference um, uh, between, maybe that analogy, this analogy is not correct, but I like to think as the containers, it's going to be, uh, many containers living inside of a virtual machine, you know, but now that virtual machine cannot be, uh, I, I don't need to be worried about it because maybe I get the container as a pass service, as a platform as a service. So 
he can uh, have that 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 difference in, in weight in in capabilities. In the case of the closer the containers, I have a fault uh, fault domain or I have a problem. Any container running it's rapidly recreated by the orchestration of another cluster mod node. So if something happened in my node, okay, then automatically it's gonna be uh, uh, running in another node. It's gonna be created another node for that uh, fault tolerance. But in the case of the virtual machine, what happened? If I have a failover, then the server in that cluster has to be restarting again into the new server. So instead of the container, just uh, move or move to other one, okay? Um, imagine that you are watching a movie, just a simple example. Imagine that you are watching a movie with your friend. You and your friend both had computers and you're watching a movie on your computer and some way your computer crashes, right? So you just change to your computer, your friend's computer and you keep watching the movie where you left off. But in the case of virtual machine, you cannot do that because you only have one computer. So you have to restart the computer in order to do that again and deploy once again the server. So it's according to what you need. It's it's what you are going to uh, deploy, okay? And well, we almost done the monitoring. One of uh, the, the tools we get in, in Azure, it's the, it's the monitoring. I will show you. Let me just how easy it's to access the monitor in, in Azure. Here you got it in your menu. You have the monitor here. And what you can do and see in your monitor, you can visualize all your resources. You can create alerts, metrics, you can watch the activity log, what has been happening inside of your portal, inside of your solution. As well, you can query those logs according to, to your need and you can filter. Well, I don't have anyone created here because this is a new lab that I'm using. Let's see if I can create in here alerts and I can create alerts right I want to create an alert maybe alert rule or action group or processing rules I can monitor pretty much everything happening inside of my whole solution okay in that what's going on in the containers what's going on in the net networks what's uh what's going on in my key vaults I can monitor everything inside of my my uh, my solution inside uh, the service. As well, I can check the service health to visualize when the network is going to be on maintenance or I need to create a service health for anything. Let me know, for example, I create an alert. Let me know when my region is going to be on maintenance. Let me know when uh, my, my, my data center could be um, For example, the API groups, what kind of service is going to be the auto scaling is going to be available is not going to be available. Please let me know. And I can create all those rules in my monitor. So my monitor, where it's going to be there is for me monitoring everything. It's not the same thing than an advisor. The advisor is going to give me course advices about uh, the solutions I'm, I'm giving in Azure, maybe it will be advised me to turn on or turn off certain resource, or it's going to advise me to increase decrease certain uh, subscription. In the case of the monitor, what I'm doing, I'm going to be monitoring um, all of my my resources. And how do you configure the Azure monitor? Well, you can just put it here. You can visualize metrics. You can query and analyze logs. You can set up the alerts and actions. Maybe you can create an automation task um, that it, it's triggered by an alert. You see, so you can create all of those things. What happened with the monitoring core? 
for uh, the service Azure's. Well, you're gonna collect metrics, you're gonna all the activity logs, you can diagnostic the logs, and you can use it for critical alerts and notifications. So the monitor, it's really cool to have it and to visualize it uh, once in a while. All the things and all the components that you can watch in, in your monitor, it's the insights, you can visualize dashboards, use the Power BI and workbooks. You can analyze through the metric explorer and the log analytics, you can analyze as much as you need. Of course, you're gonna have a response because you can create alerts or auto scale or do that, those automation tasks being triggered by the alerts, or you can integrate things, event hubs, logic apps, you can ingest and export APS and, and, and connect via REST. You can do that with the, with the monitor. So pretty much, let me just close this and put it back again, the portal, where's the portal? Portals here. So you see, I got the applications. I want to see the inside of my applications. I don't have any. I want to see the insights of my virtual machine. Storage accounts. I think I have one. One storage account in this one. It says that I have one. I can access it. And I can see the activity log on that storage account or that resource that I that I need. I can see all the the instance, how many transactions. I can have all the graphics and all the metrics. Okay. You can define in the in, in the in the monitor you can define metrics and logs okay you can um, create your own metrics you, you will define how will be the way that you can create that uh, that monitor remember that they are lightweight and they're capable to support real-time scenarios the telemetry all the graphics that you get here in the in the in the metrics or the analytics can be performed data and can be combined data um, someone was asking if you can bring those uh, activity alerts on a third party yes you can export your data you can export uh, your logs data your matrix your alerts or you can set up an alert and then communicate it communicate with the third party software that you have and and so on um, Yes, it's possible to, to do that. But once again, I don't want to go really deep into that because otherwise the people is gonna get confused. It's just uh, knowing the surface of the, of, the, of the resources and understand what are they and what we can do, okay? That's how we get to become administrator of the Azure Cloud. We have to identify and learn to identify the different types of data that we got in the monitoring, such as the application or what happened. Always happens to me. I get the escape button. Now it is, it's to the application monitoring data, which is gonna help you to perform some functionality of the code that you're reading, regardless of its platform. You can monitor the operating system as well. You can monitor all the Azure resources, virtual machine, databases, instances, containers, subscriptions, everything that you need. Subscription monitoring. What's the operation and management of the Azure subscription? Who had created new subscription? Who entered that subscription? Who uh, make a move? everything you can monitor as well you can monitor the tenants because sometimes you have a uh, multi-tenants and you need to be monitor what are they doing so you can do it as well and you can of course monitor your azure active directory so in the case of the logs events okay if you are monitoring an application you can uh, get the information from your application log and the agnostic log 
because that's going to be working between your application and the operating system. In the case that you want to monitor the resource, what you're going to get is a diagnostic log. So that means how it's, uh, I won't say health because I, we have something else called service health, but how is uh, uh, everything working on? So it's going to give you a diagnostic, okay? It's not that you're going to have like all the application uh, logs like in the application event, but in the resource, you're going to have the diagnostic. How is that resource working? What are the metrics? Um, how, how it's been uh, uh, working on? How many con con connections or regarding to, to the way that you have deployed that resource? The data could be can be uh, um, archived in the storage account. So all of the data, all of the application logs, diagnostic logs and everything, activity logs as well, um, is going to be storage in your account. And also you can analyze that data with Power BI. So that's going to be easy for you to bring that data, data in and run any uh, anal analyzed uh, software. And it could be like from Azure or third party. You can also query the activity logs. That, that's what I wanted to show you, but I don't have, like, maybe I can have an activity log in my, in my account. And that means that I can query. It means that I can look for and search wherever I need, okay? I need to find a query for... Um, a special a special a user for a special admin so i can query and i can filter those results according the way i i want it so we can add filters we can search by category by recommendations uh, we can filter by the management group subscriptions the event severity times but i'm sorry we can do all that and of course we can download the CSV so we can have it like printed version. Oh, we can also pin uh, current filters. Like if you are looking all the time for the same in the monitoring, you can like pin that one. It's like save it as a frequent as a frequent uh, check, right? And you can just pin it instead of doing the filtering all over. And you can add the different filters at the same time. Not only one, you can... Um, create your own uh, filters. You know, you can customize your filters and that will be easier for what you're looking for. So also you can configure the alerts and you can set up like, tell me an alert with my machine it's over or when my app it's not working or send me an alert when someone has a, 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 an invalid access, we can create alerts. We can create alert rules and of course we can manage those those rules okay we can also create it by severity we can um, give them um, like a priority in severity level and we can have them by severity and we can have them categorized by new acknowledge and closed like I have a new alert I, I have an alert I'm, I'm a knowledge about it Okay, or I have an alert that is closed. That means that it's not um, over being a, a problem for me. So we can have alerts and we can configure alerts in the monitor. As well, we can create rules. And the rules can also <coughs> set me an alert criteria or um, that rule can create me an automation task. For creating a rule, we need to set up the scope where we heading, what is the target selection, okay? And what is going to be the criteria for that alert? We can um, alert rules in details, like from the severity, as I was telling you, description and so on. And we can set up that alert for an action group. Maybe we can notify the team. Maybe I need to deploy a task. Maybe I to uh, uh, use a runbook or use a webhook. It's up to it. So we can set up an alert, and according to that alert, I will have, of course, I can trigger many things, or I can just be notified uh, with it. 
We can create the actions group for setting up some alerts where it's going to be configured the method, method in which users will be notified when the action group triggers. So I will like, uh, when I have uh, 300 users deploy a second machine and then notify everybody in the group, right? Uh, I can configure the method in which the, the action group is going to be performed when the action group triggers. So I can create notifications and I can create actions in those in those groups as well we have the analytics uh more is them and configure the log analytics so we can determine the uses of of the logs like what we are uh, going to use it let me just go to the lab one more time and i will go to my monitor and I will go to analytics. And I will create, well, I need to create first a workspace for, for that. So if I want to work with the analytics and I want to analyze um, something uh, customized that I customize, then I need to create, first of all, a workspace where all that data is concentrating in so I can work with that analytics. And oh no, it was the like the logs, right? Let me show you the logs then. To the logs. I need to select the scope. I need to select my this one. Okay, all of them. All of them here. And I can create queries from what I need to find. I can create my own query in the analytics. So I can write queries and interact with the results. Okay. I can create my own query and check all of the insights that I got, all the applications, all the metrics, all the rules, everything that I can be monitor, I can be uh, also query their logs. I create a workspace, uh, like I was saying, if I want to run analytics, I recommend you to first run uh, your workspace because uh, we can have different um, information to be analyzed. And then in order to have everything in its own place, I recommend you to create a workspace for the different analysis that you are going to run. So you can have multiple uh, workspaces per subscription and you can have access to more than one workspace. Okay. Remember that a workspace will provide you with a graph, geographic location, data isolation and a scope. And with a scope, I mean the targeting. Where are you targeting that uh, workspace? You are targeting to a subscription. You are targeting to a solution, to a virtual machine, to an app. What is the target of uh, of that workspace? What is the scope? Okay. I don't I don't explain you too much uh, about these parts because I know that you already tried it and you already don't have done that in, into the lab. So all the the parameters to be filled into the configuration i believe for you it's nothing new it's something that you already know how to do okay so that leaves me more time to keep talking about the resources you as well you have the query lock for the analytics data which is going to be common queries and, and query language for custom searches you can create your own for audit, monitor resources, virtual desktop containers, and so on. You can create your own queries and you can choose when to run it. Okay, you can also choose when to run it. You can save or have log searches automatically and create alerts. And like I was saying, you can export the data to Power BI or Excel. Someone was asking like, how to bring that information into a third party uh, uh, analyze. 
was just export it to Excel, export it, the CSV or the XLM, and then you can uh, bring it in into, into your own uh, third party. As well, you can create uh, an automation task that is triggered by an alert in the monitor, and that automation task could be download the file and send it via email to your recipient, which at the same time could be that third party analyzed software, right? And then from that end, you should configure what you're going to do once you receive that email, once you receive that information. But yes, it's, it's possible to analyze it with a third party. Um, the queries, well, for the people added into databases, you know the basic queries, how to, to run uh, a query or a search. And it's going to be a structure in this way. You get the system logs, the agents, the custom logs, and you can set up the alerts or the Windows alert uh, event logs. The first one are events, okay? And it works for event or for system logs because there are events that happen. The, ne the next structure is going to call the heartbeat, okay? The heartbeat is more like the agent working there for you and you can configure the the agent, that's what it's like the heart, it's it's the main important thing of the analysis. Your own log, that is going to be customized log, which is uh, how do you choose to do that customization of the query of the analysis and also the alert. You can set up alerts um, by creating those alert rules. And you can create other tables, other kind of tables according to the query that you that you want to run and last but not least and before we go I just should leave that to the end hmm. the data protection how the data is going to be protected in Azure I remember telling you since the first day something I really love about Azure it's the security so you have to be sure you need to be uh, uh, um, aware that all your data is going to be protected because you can create backups because you can create a fault uh, a vault sorry because you have the fault domain because you have high availability because you have resiliency because you have redundancy in in, in your storage so your data your data is always going to be protected as well, everything, if it's of your choose, could be encrypted. So you can configure files and folders for the backups, okay? The Azure-based uh, service used to backup and restore data in Microsoft Cloud is what we call it, the Azure Backup. You can do that uh, storage of the backup in an automatic way, you can choose how often and which uh, which frequency you want those backups to, to happen. You can have multiple storage options where you're going to save that. You have unlimited data transfer as well when you back up. The data, as I said, is encryption, and you have a consistent backup in your application. As well, the retention of the data is long term, so it's going to be there. We have something called the Azure Backup Center, and into the Azure Backup Center is a single panel where it's going to help you to manage all the backups ac across all the, the Azure environment. It's where you're gonna have all your, your data source-centric managed focus in what you are backing up. So you have to be um, a, a center in what are you exactly backing up. It's gonna be the whole solution, it's gonna be part of the solution, it's gonna be only the data, it's gonna be also the configuration, it's gonna be uh, all the information of my users, it's gonna be only my information, and, and so on. So you can, uh, from there, uh, visualize what are the source and centric uh, data that you wanted to back up. As well, the, the integrations, uh, enables you to manage at, at scale, so you can also uh, back up at scale. If, if your solution is growing up at scale, as well, the configuration of your backup is going to be 
that that way. You can set up the recovery service vault, which is a backup option. In the recovery service uh, vault, you will choose which, um, what are you saving? You can save from virtual machines, you can the, uh, save the backup the file share in Azure, maybe a, a, a database, it's up to you. And you can um, choose what kind of workload you want to back up in that vault, okay? And you can do that both in your cloud or in your on-premises. You can do it in, in, both, in both ways. There is an agent that is going to help you to manage all the uh, Azure recovery service. So you can back up or recover files and folders on physical or virtual Windows operating systems. You need no separate backup server required. So this, this is good because you don't need an extra uh, server for that, uh, for, that, uh, um, for that backup. You don't need any application uh, like file folder and volume level restore only, right? And also, it's not support for Linux. That's something um, so many um, developers didn't like. But we still can uh, have its own backup safe. So if we deploy a virtual machine that it's running with Linux, um, we can probably not back it up like in total. Okay? We recommend to use Windows, of course, because the infrastructure is to run on Microsoft. You configure a virtual machine for the backup. Uh, there's three ways to do it. We can have the snapshot. It's like having an image or an ISO image in, in, your, in, your, in your computer, so you can run it up again. You can have an Azure backup, or you can choose an Azure site recovery. The difference is that this, while the snapshots provide you with a quick and simple option for backing up, the Azure backup supports application consistent backups for both Windows and Linux VMs. So in the backup, I can do Linux, right? In the service vault, I cannot do Linux, only in the backup, okay? And also we have the Azure site recovery that it will go, it's going to protect your virtual machine, okay? From any disaster scenario, when the whole region experiences an outage. So if, if I have an Azure site recovery and I have my region in central US and something happened to central US, my data, okay, is gonna be protected in another region, right? So we can have all those uh, kind of protections in, in, by backing up our, our data. We can create the virtual um, snapshots. It's just like a token, right? And it's gonna reduce recovery wait time. So don't wait data transfer to the vault to finish. So as soon as it, the snapshots is running, it's gonna be transferring data to the vault, okay? And the restore retention can go from one to five days. Oh, I already talked to you about this one. And to back up the virtual machines, okay, all that you have to do is you create a recovery service vault. Just go here, uh, recovery service vault, or I can choose backup items or a backup vault. So in order to, to, to be an administrator, you need to understand the features, all the features that we have here and all the resources um, might not be like in deep or in perfection as expertise, but we can, uh, we should know them, like at least to know what kind of uh, resources do we have. Let's call this AZ104 DMO Vault. Oh, all right. US and what happened? I create. Do, 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 do. 
GMOs. Four. Here we create. I think the deployment is being is being created. Oh yes. So I create my service vault and I choose to and I will choose which uh, resources I want to save in that vault. So I use the portal to to define the backup and I can back up the virtual machine if I want. It's still not uh, deploying, but I can back up the virtual machine. As well, I can back up the extensions. Remember I was telling you about the, the extensions and the agent must be installed on the Azure virtual machine. In order to back it up, I need that uh, my virtual machine have the agent for backups. That's important. I do it again. What happened if we've uh, managed the soft delete? We almost done people. Uh, the backup data is retained for 14 additional days. In, also, if we by mistakes, we make it, uh, 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 an error and we delayed something, well, if we back up that data, it's going to be uh, retained for 14 days. So recover soft delete backup items using an on delete operation. And it's also available for storage account containers and also the file shares natively built in for all the recovery service vaults. So you can have your backup item. Oh, sorry, this is not the one. I just I need to change some lights, yes. Thank you. So we have the backup item, which is going to be the deleted data and the undeleted backup, which is going to be 14 days. So I can erase something by, by mistake, but the backup data is going to be retained for 14 days. So imagine I just delete the backup because, oh, I just make a mistake in the version and that wasn't the version I was trying to, to delete. I got no problem. Um, that backup is going to be retained for 14 days. So we have all the information right right there. And guess what, people? Believe it or not, we have finished to review pretty much everything. And during these days of the lessons, during these lessons, we have to review a lot of topics, okay? And I am sure that you have quite some doubts, but like I said in the beginning, it's not about becoming expert, like expert in each resource, okay? If you want to become expert in all the resources, it's gonna take like long time, um, longer time than you think. So don't worry, don't rush, it's, it's little by little. You've been learning, you've been uh, learning concepts that I'm sure that you didn't hear before. And I'm just opening here to see my my outline, to see if I... And, and during these uh, lessons, we were talking, actually, I'm just going to hit here. No, not here. And during these uh, lessons, let me just, oh, sorry. We've been talking about the users, the groups, users and groups. Okay. We also talked about the identity, remember? We also talk about the Azure Active Directory. Now you understand the Azure Active Directory. We talked about also a little bit about the subscriptions. Subscriptions, right? We talked about the RBAC, the role-based access control. We talked about the tools in the for the administrator, which are the tools we got the CLI, we got the Azure Bolt portal, let me just put it like this. We got the PowerShell, PowerShell. We got tools to, to uh, use in Azure. What else we got? What else we were talking, we've been talking 
talking. Uh, let me just put it here a little bit and let me just. We talked about, I have it again. We talked about the templates, the ARM templates. They are there to help us. We can download template from the marketplace. Remember, we also talked about the virtual networks, the VMs. We talk about the network security groups, the NSGs, remember? Um, oh, one really important, we talked about the policies. Now we understand that we can create policies and we can create rules and like someone happened yesterday. Um, he was trying to change the Active Directory because he doesn't have enough privileges because the policy said that that subscription it's not complained complained with the with the policy and what else we were talking um we talked uh slightly mentioned oh the firewall remember like the first line of defense as well um about the vnet peering that you understand that we can peer uh, different vnets together. And we also we were talking about the, uh, uh, a hub vnet, right? What else? Um, we talked about the, uh, a little bit about the DNS. Remember that we we are um, give uh, we are uh, given for a DNS resolution every time we create a, a virtual network, every time we create a, a virtual machine. Okay, so we've been talking and we've been covering a lot of topics, uh, believe it or not, even that it's on the surface, it's important because now you understand more those, uh, those resources. Um, also, we talked about the VPNs, remember, the VPNs, the private and, and, and uh, v private VPN, sorry, and the gateways. We talked uh, about the storage, the different types of storage, especially we were discussing a lot about the blob storage. Blobs, only one blob storage, right? And the security, security, of course, the security of the, the, the storage. Today, we talked about the Kubernetes, the, AK, the AKS. We talked about the containers, we talked about the virtual machines. We talked about the security. And we talked about the backup. Backup and vault. Oh, also about the monitor. So we've been talking all a lot of all the resources that we have in, uh, in Azure. Also, we talked about uh, today about uh, the, well, it was actually yesterday, the app services. Service, what happened? Why it's going like that? Why it's going like that? Well, we talked about app services. We talked about um, the web services, how to implement the web services. So we have been covered a lot during this uh, lessons during these sessions and that's pretty much it for today so now it's time to go on a break and see you on um, on the lab session uh, no worry if, sometimes in the lab session I'm also talking it's not a lecture but sometimes I'm also talking and I can clarify some some doubts yeah, we talked about the path solutions, the VM extensions, the backups, the firewalls. That's very nice. And that, that's what I want you to do, guys. Like, just start to recognize all of the, 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 the resources, to start to recognize what are the tools we have in Azure, okay? One more time, we are not becoming experts because that requires some time to be used, all right? But... Uh, it's, uh, it's important to start understanding what are uh, the resources and tools as an administrators we should know in order that, well, like they say here, like they cannot, uh, how you say when, 
I would think how to, how how to say that in English because it's different. It's something like a, like a phrase we said in Spanish. Uh, but yes, uh, see you in the lab session. Have a wonderful time. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope that you enjoy it. And see you at 5.30 in that session. So see you next time.